Do it. All right. Hello, gentlemen. Mike Laszlo, Sabado Cigaria. How are you? Justin, how are you doing? Fantastic. That's Happy not New York City behind July. you. That's not New York City behind you, Dustin. Where no, are you? I am, uh, I am recording on location from uh, Harford County, Maryland, as we speak. Well, it looks uh, beautiful. Beautiful little outdoor space here. You're, are you feeding nice the birds from the palm from of my, your hand? My tiny New York City apartment. <laughs> <laughs> it looks great. Well, happy Independence Day to everybody. Absolutely. Happy Fourth of July. That looks like a Norman Rockwell um, uh, setting for Fourth of July, if I've ever seen it, Dustin. Um, so beautiful trees. <laughs> I to there's greenery. You guys today. Yeah. Nice well, you are. Colors on the house. You are. It's good. Any, any yeah, town USA. A little, little natural sunlight. Ooh. Some beautiful outdoor space. Birds chirping. No, Love it. Doesn't get much better. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, lots to talk about this week, gentlemen. Um, yes, we do. Love to uh, to kick things off. You know, there's a really interesting piece uh, in Eater uh, just a couple of days ago that uh, Ryan Sutton put out. He's the restaurant critic for Eater in New York City, uh, titled "Why This Restaurant Critic Isn't Dining Out Right Now." Uh, and you know, he makes a pretty pretty strong argument for um, the, all the reasons why opening restaurants right now is just not a good idea. Um, you know, mainly coming at it from the point of view of, of its risk to not only uh, guests, but also to restaurant staffs. Um, seems like he had a pretty, pretty bad bout with COVID himself, uh, really understands the potential risk of all of this. Um, he's not planning on dining out anytime soon. He's doing strictly takeout. Um, and you know, this article is really interesting and obviously it's coming from his particular point of view. Uh, but it begs the question, you know, what is, uh, what's kind of the responsibility of the restaurant here and, you know, get on the guest side, should we be going out or should we be staying in? What do you guys think? Well, well you know, here's the funny thing. When I read the article, I thought to our, uh, to our episode last week, when we talked about the consumer responsibility, um, in playing by the rules and you know, being a part of the solution in the process of staying safe. And that's exactly what I thought about. Here we have an article from, you know, from a, a critic talking about him as a consumer, not in a critic role, but in a consumer, saying, I'm, I'm gonna be a part of what I believe is a solution, staying away and doing takeout only. So that, that's the, my, was, was my initial uh, impression. Saab? Um, I think going back from there, I think he does bring up a good point. And one thing I've heard more and more um, is from employees actually and asking restaurants, what are you doing to make sure that I'm safe? And what are the steps that you're, you're taking? And so when you, when in New York, we were under lockdown and you started to see the different restaurant groups put out their safety plans and, and their, um, and the procedures of how they change first, it's like, okay, great. This is crowdsourcing to help set us up as restaurants. But now I also see a different purpose of that. And that's saying, Hey, this is our commitment to our team. And, saying completely understand if you don't want to come back, you by no means have to. You're also not going to be passed up and lose your job because of it. Um, everyone has their own situations and would never want to put anyone at risk. But if you do decide to come back, these are the parameters of how we're going to be, uh, how we're going to be um, operating. And I think that is something that I've seen a great deal uh, and heard a great deal of about this past week um, from that perspective which was something that I didn't really, I mean, I, I was aware of it, but that's the first step because without team, you're not gonna be able to take care of guests or not even have that option to open. And while some restaurants would love just to do takeout, others might be in a situation where they can't. And so they're trying to see, okay, what can I do to make ends meet in the safest manner possible without putting people at risk? And that's where I think um, I, outdoor dining, uh, I wouldn't be comfortable doing indoor dining personally in a restaurant. But having dined outdoors and, um, and, and seen things uh, of that nature and learned a lot more about it, I feel better about it um, than being in an indoor space. Well, and that's the interesting thing too, Saab, what you touch on is, so we're talking about not dying, you know, restaurants that have to be open. Um, they, you know, they have to, maybe takeout's not their best option or even an option at all. And that, you know, that's the balance is, I think, that needs to be struck where, Okay, it, maybe it, we can all, I think we can all agree. It would just be safer if nobody went out, period. We can just agree. Don't leave your house. It will be safer. But we all know that, that we just can't do that extreme. So then it goes to, well, can the restaurants even be open at all? 
and then you go to the restaurant owners, uh, you know, and quite a bit of our audience are restaurant owners or work in restaurant, the restaurant world. It's, it's just fundamentally unfair that they can't run their business, make a living, um, pay their rent, pay their mortgage, pay their employees and, and bring out, bring home an income check, you know? And so struggling with that of how do these small restaurants or big restaurants as well, how do you balance that? And, you know, it is a topic we have talked about over and over over the past three week, three months, but because we can't, you know, it is a hard balance to strike. And you have states now we're going to talk about later that are closing down yet again after having reopened. But as a restaurant owner, how are you saying to guests, it's going to be safe, saying to your employees, it's going to be safe, saying to yourself, it's going to be safe. I don't know how you balance that. I really don't. I don't know how you answer the question. I don't know how you balance it. Yeah, it's, it's a really difficult. To their, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's really, I think, you know, to each their own in this situation. I think it's both the restaurant side as well as the guest side. You know, where I've kind of landed on it is, you know, the, the, the restaurant tour is going to have to make a decision at some point, you know, looking at their finances, whether they can open in a safe way or, or not, first of all. Should they open? Um, you know, if they're going to open, if they are going to open their doors, you know, I think they do have a responsibility to absolutely be as safe as possible and set up some new protocols so that they're ensuring at least their team safety and then also, you know, doing things to show their guests that they're also being very safe. Um, and then, you know, seeing just what happens with that. And I think on the guest side of things, um, you know, it's absolutely your individual point of view whether you want to actually go out and eat or not right nobody's forcing you to go out and eat so if you are going out you're probably going to want to pick places that um that are, are doing things the right way so Good. you know i i think i guess where i land on, on on ryan's perspective is i don't think there should be any over kind of sweeping legislation necessarily that gets put in place that that keeps people from doing uh doing anything unless it's proven somehow that like outdoor dining or just dining at all together is, is like really harmful to the situation. But if it's not, then, you know, you got to kind of let people do what they can to survive on the business side and then let the guests do what they want, you know, let them take the temperature of their own risk uh, and, and act accordingly. Yeah. I, you know, here's an interesting point, And I think a couple of this has been brought up out there in response to his article is, you know, him as a critic, and this just kind of goes to speaking, gen you know, speaking to the industry. Uh, you know, Ryan as a critic, uh, maybe has a larger following. I, don't, I really don't know how big his following is, but you know, he reads on, eats on. I'm sorry, writes on Eater New York, and you know, he says, "I'm not going out," and here are the reasons why. Uh, you know, I think restaurant owners, uh, you know, what do they take from that? Now you have a critic saying, maybe they the perspective would be, you have a critic saying, "Don't go out." You know, is that a critic's place to be to using their platform to be putting that position out. I, I, have, an, I have an opinion on that, but uh, why don't you go ahead? I think it, of course he does. Uh, and he's offering perspective in, in terms of, that's one perspective of people that are dining out. And uh, it could be, yes, he's had it, but also what if it's somebody that has somebody at home that has COVID or that has an immune deficiency order? Yeah. They probably feel the same because that is a way that puts other people at risk. And that's so, I, but it's not, the conversation we're having is not contained solely to the restaurant business. This is something that is broader in terms of how we're approaching this as a country. Yeah, so agreed. him to offer perspective, just because he's a restaurant critic, I don't see any problem with that. That's something that's a broader, you could apply that to any industry that is out there right now. Yep. No, and I, I agree with that completely. And I, I, my opinion is, well, it's, it's information. We all have our own minds and we can process that information and make our own decisions. So the idea that anybody would be upset that a critic wrote the article based on his personal experience, including having, you know, having COVID, going out to restaurants, seeing with his own eyes uh, what, what, you know, or observing certain things with his own eyes and, and then, you know, rendering an article with an opinion, I'm completely fine with that. I do not have to agree with it. I do not have to take action based on it. But it's a perspective that I appreciate. I think it's well written. And I, I don't know this gentleman, but I, I appreciate the article. I, I don't know if it's going to change my behavior, but to be upset about it, I think is absolutely absurd, frankly. Um, and, I, and I do th think that you make a great point. This is not just the restaurant industry. I mean, it's, it's, every, it's clearly everything. It's, to me, the, it, the hospitality industry stands apart, however, because of the, the close touches to customers that are expected. 
and you know you are hovering uh, over top of, of folks with menus with meals and that's you know in a restaurant as a diner that's what I want I want to be paid attention I want you know paid attention to I, I want you to be around because I'm coming in for an experience only if I was coming in just for food I would go to a grocery store you know and so I'm coming in for a meal I think that's where it's different than some of the other industries not all of them of course barbershops, salons, you know, massage parlors, those types of things, completely, you know, more intimate, of course, but restaurants and the hospitality world, hotels, for instance, I mean, you are, you're on top of one another. That's the whole nature of the business. Mm -hmm. So what is the, what is the place for a critic now? So in the past, you know, they have their weekly reviews that they're putting out. Yeah. Some uh, publications have laid off their critics. I know New York uh, Magazine did. Um, Ryan's still on the Eater staff. Pete Wells is still on the, on the New York Times staff. What is their purpose in this way? You know, is it to critique the existing yeah, that's operations that people are doing? Or um, how do they, I mean, they're in the same position where they're trying to keep bread on the table for their families. Yeah. How, how would you approach that if you were a critic? Yeah, I've, I've been thinking a lot about this because I think, um, you know, now, and probably for the foreseeable future, I would think until things really get back to a normal, healthy, good place, uh, there, there's probably not a, a lot of room right now for critics to be going into restaurants and writing critical reviews. Um, I just don't think it's, with the, with the industry being so damaged right now, it's just not, uh, I don't think it's the right thing to do. So my mind is, you know, how can critics be supportive of the industry? How can they use their platforms to, um, you know, amplify the right voices or draw attention to, um, to certain places or kind of lead the charge in, in showing what, you know, what the restaurant industry kind of 2.0 or whatever it is coming out of this uh, can really look like. And instead of, instead of kind of criticizing restaurants or, you know, going in and, and evaluating their food or the experience, um, maybe they can utilize their platform as a, as a voice for evolution and change in the right direction. Yeah, you know, here's the way I look at it. I, I agree with you guys. With a critic, a food critic, for instance, I mean, I read to to understand what your you know what your experience was and your critique of was food and service at a you know at a restaurant. That's what you do, um, you know, and that's what I'm reading for. I do not read your article because I think that you are an expert in biotechnology and viruses and how to clean up you know disasters. And so for, you know, for you to critique, you know, the cleaning measures, for instance, I mean, that's not why I'm reading. And, and I, think yeah. it, I think it would frankly just be irresponsible and out of place to go to start critiquing those things. It's just not what you do. If you want to mm -hmm. bring in an industrial hygienist and a, you know, a virus specialist and, and talk to me about cleanliness, but not a food critic. And I also agree, this is not the time necessarily to be critiquing food and not just because we want to let bad food pass, but that we're in such a position right now, restaurants especially, where this is not a fair grade. It's not a fair grading scale. You know, you'd always mm -hmm. have to asterisk it and say, "Yeah, well, the supply chain was this, and we were limited to X, Y, and Z." As opposed to, we had our full. Like, this is the product. This is the absolute product that our restaurant was built to produce. Mm -hmm. You don't have that right now, right. so I think it's unfair. And and I don't. Again, the market gets to speak. If you're open in COVID time and you're making a really terrible hamburger, well you're not going to be selling many hamburgers and, it, and you shouldn't. But is this the time for a critic to, you know, to do a, a visit and write some big expose on how bad your hamburger was? I, I don't. And, and I don't think, and nobody, I don't, I haven't seen anybody doing I haven't that. Either. They I all haven't. realize this is not the time for criticism. I mean, if you are, it's one thing I've had, here's my business plan. Here's what I've been dreaming up my whole, whole career. And I've got my investors and I've set out to accomplish this dream. That's one thing. But then it's another thing to say, a week ago, I realized that I was told that I can't operate my business within the four walls. I need to come up with something on the fly. What can I do and get it out to market so I can keep the lights on? That's very different. Uh, but I think you, you touched on it. Food criticism is part of food writing. So it's almost taking out that specialty and taking a broader look at it and saying, how can I actually, as a critic, I'm helping educate diners about trends, what's happening, and uh, a little bit about the history of those, of those dishes or those restaurants. How do you tell that story today in terms of what the struggles are of restaurants, what they're up against, how they're thinking through it, 
and like you said, use that platform to amplify those voices. And I think some have done that very well. I think one one person I'd you know shout out is um, Gary He. He's a was a photographer. Um, I think he got a Beard Award for um, a, an article he did for Eater. And he's also done a lot more writing. He's been hitting the beat uh, in New York, telling the stories of what it's like in these COVID times, whether it's following a delivery person uh, around the city and what it's really like during these times, or following uh, in, in a restaurant and uh, documenting through photography and then putting words to it of a day in the life of, of a restaurant tour this, in, in this unforeseen time. So um, I think there is gonna be some amazing food journalism that comes out of this. And just like restaurants are trying to pivot, I think food critics need to pivot as well in their own right, uh, which is going to be very interesting to see, not just now, but then what is it like to return because yeah. who's going to be the first one that's going to be throwing, um, you know, kind of throwing stones at, at a restaurant when they come out of this. And I think Pete Wells also did a, a really interesting piece a couple of weeks ago about his first time dining out in a restaurant. And I think he went to Veselka, um, which is a um, uh, known for their, their pierogies and such uh, over here in the East Village and ate outside. And I think it, he highlighted the humanity and, the the nurturing that you get out of restaurants and what you long for and was it the best food he ever had probably not but it was the hospitality and how it all came together and something that you just miss and crave and that's where i think restaurants coming out of it focusing on the craveability and the hospitality that's what's going to welcome most people back in not be the target of criticism yeah, yeah and i think um you know there's there's a I love the the word you use, storytelling, um, because I think so many restaurateurs, restaurants in general, are going to have incredible stories coming out of this, right? There's going to be so many things that could be really inspiring to write about. Um, you know, it could be even just the, the survival tactics of, of what these people went through or the, you know, the various things that they did to, uh, to help the frontline people or whatever it was that these restaurants did in order to kind of get themselves through the pandemic and, and, and stay operating on the other side. Um, you know, that transcends, you know, a lot of things, right? Like it doesn't matter anymore how good the food is right out of the gates. Like let's talk about how amazing some of these people have been through this and, and tell those stories. For the storytelling, I want to bring back the people remember um, diary on MTV. You think you know, but you have no idea. This is the diary yeah. of a restaurant tour. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, right. <laughs> but though, that to me is, I, I would much rather. I don't. I actually don't like reading food critics. I, I just don't. They don't it. like reading your work either, Mike. Just no, I, believe me, I know. <laughs> no, <laughs> none of them hired exactly. me to, to type it out or to read it. Um, but I do love food journalism, and I think it's different. I really do. And maybe I'm wrong, yes. but I think I think food journalism is totally different. And I I would love to read. And, and the articles we're even talking about this week are, are interesting reads to me. I do not need to, I, I am not interested in, in what the food looked like, how it was presented. I just don't care right now. I really don't. Um, but I do care about the industry as a whole because it's our industry and the unique perspectives that come from that. And I think food journalism did really digging in. And, and I, I'd like to see some hard hitting food journalism, asking the questions that we've been asking over the last couple of months. Why are you even reopening? How are you possibly going to make it 18 months? And if you don't have an answer to that, why did you even reopen? I mean, those types of things. I, I love that. I, I want to hear more about that. Uh, one well, thing, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, you, uh, you finished your thought. No, I was going to jump to one other idea on the critics, but go ahead. Well, I think to your point, it's the education of it. And I've seen very few pieces uh, written about the economics of the of the industry and if you're talking about telling a story or amplifying a voice right now when you know the restaurant industry is saying we need a 120 billion dollar bailout fund why and helping people understand the economics and what it takes to reopen a restaurant because i really don't think consumers know that and i've seen that and we all we've all seen it um when they come to restaurants like i can't believe a hamburger is this much yeah. well all the things that go into getting that hamburger on that plate and there's the the story of um the the guest that like comes that netflix the show uh explained have you seen that show explained no. uh they, they just they just go into explanations of all kinds of various topics coronavirus explained or diamonds explained or random things explained uh you know restaurants explained would be well, pretty you get interesting it, you get it as a psalm saying oh well why am i paying this much why am i paying 50 dollars for a bottle of wine when i can buy it for for 20 dollars 
Yep. And then I've seen like the, there's like a cartoon of it. And then the, the owner comes over and he takes away the glass, takes the tablecloth off, takes away the, uh, the table and then kicks out the chair and says, here's your bottle of wine. You know, it's like, <laughs> yeah, there's please. so much else that goes into, yeah, people uh, don't get into it. that. Right. Yeah. And so this yep. is the time to be telling that story to help understand it um, of the economics. There's a lot of public education that needs to happen around restaurants. Cause I think one of the things we've talked about a lot on this show is, you know, these places are going to probably have to raise their prices a bit coming out of this. And that's going to require a little bit of explanation and understanding. And we'll put it in the consumer side. I'll put it in the show notes. um, But the article, how to, uh, you know, how is a Grub Street article we're talking about here and about how a restaurant's going to reopen. It talks about prices going up and, you know, it's annoying to me that prices would go up, but I, as a business person, I, I completely understand why the prices would go up. You're, Revenues down, the food costs are up. I mean, things go up, and yeah, I think a, a a a speaking point for us in the future will be let's break down a cost of a glass of wine in a restaurant. Here's why it's twelve dollars, yep. and I'm gonna you know I think that's what we're gonna do is we're gonna explain why it's twelve dollars because people don't understand. They think it should be three dollars, or it, you know, it, and so the economics of that are important, and I think communicating that through effective journalism could be could be helpful to the industry in a way that we just haven't seen yet Uh, the one point i wanted before we move on i I wanted to make a point you know wine critics i think are in a great place because the wine in the bottle has not been changed by covid and the wine critics don't have to worry about uh, you know they don't have to write about the market they don't have to write about anything other than the taste and the you know what went into the bottle and that's pretty static so i think uh, I was just thinking as we were talking about this, wine critics seem to be in a good place right now. They are, but I think they also have a responsibility too, knowing that it's, as we've explored talking to people in the distiller space, in the wine space, in the grower space, it's the supply chain and it's the same supply chain. So being able to not just focus on what's in the bottle, but then to also say, what are the struggles behind this? And what is the future of, just because you're seeing this in this bottle right now at this price, is this going to exist next year? Because yeah. if I don't have the money to buy that fruit and um, I miss out on that window and those farmers don't pick those grapes and they just die on the vine, well, that goes away. So I think there's, there is a, a similar story they have to tell, but I agree. They can still write and critique about things because there's still things that are coming to market that have been in barrel for, for years, but there is the, the greater story um, that needs to be told as well. So Yeah. Um, so we talk about reopenings because I think it's like one step forward, uh, what, 37 steps back? Um, Looks like it. States, uh, have had, this, had cases rise, and as a result, you see the slowdown and the turning back of, um, uh, of some of these regulations, specifically California, Texas, Arizona, New York, and, and Florida. Um, what do you, what's your take on that, Mike? Uh, as you look at it, I'll, I'll throw it to you from a sure. consumer standpoint, I guess. Yeah. Well, I can look at it from both the consumer and then, you know, from clients who have, I've been dealing with in these different jurisdictions. Um, you know, as a consumer, it's for me personally, I'm not, I'm not going to dine in at really at all these days. So I, I don't, dine I don't in or dine um, outside. Are those the same? I'm, no, I'm, trying to I'm talking about away. dine in, okay. whether it be inside, which we're allowed to do here in Colorado um, I'm not sitting on patios. I'm not going in. Now, that's a function of the place in my life as well. I have three young kids and I'm busy, so we don't really just go out anyway. Um, but we're not really doing much takeout either. But I will say, I, I don't want to dine in. You know, so as a consumer, I, the, 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 any slowdown or shutdown is not necessarily affecting my dining habits because I'm not doing it. But it's affecting my clients and our friends in a, in a, a prolific way, of course. Especially, um, you know, think about Arizona. I was just down there last week. And yeah, I know I went to the hotbed, but the fact is I felt like it was completely safe when I got there and it looked extremely locked down and clean, but I wasn't seeing a lot of things. And I've read since then and even spoken with GMs of, of you know, hotels or restaurants down there in the week since. And they just said, look, some people are just ruining it for everybody. And this goes to Florida as well. And, and from what I'm hearing about Los Angeles as well, that they just now have to shut down. And, the, and this is a death. This is what Lachlan uh, Patterson talked about er, a couple months ago with us on the show. Do you reopen only to be shut down? I mean, this would be the, the, the you know, he said that in April, this would be the worst case scenario. Well, we're living it now. And, and so I think that's, to me, that's the big takeaway of how are you, how is a, a restaurant supposed to manage a, a shutdown or a, a huge mm-hmm. slowdown? I, I don't know. 
it's just bad. to clarify, you were in Arizona. You weren't in Tulsa for uh, uh, anything to do with politics, where you you were in uh, Arizona Tulsa. for vacation. You mean Tucson? Tucson. Or wait, what, or, what are you or, talking? No, about? I'm sorry. I, I got my states confused. Never mind. Yeah, there are different states out here in the flyover country. So <laughs> <laughs> we got fifty of them. There's not exactly. just New York, okay? <laughs> I mean, you land in LA on the way to, you know. <laughs> okay. Um, so I think no, I was more asking if you busted out your red baseball cap, Mike. Yeah. Exactly. No, I, I don't own a red. I think the red baseball cap I own is Mountain Valley Water from 1993. Oh, that's the one. <laughs> it is a good one for, for Mountain I'll Valley Water. I, I still but, have that. You know, you mentioned the um, the the case of what happens if you close, and in talking with with restaurateurs, they're looking at business plans right now that get them to break even, and the break even is to keep their teams going, keep the lights on, the rent, and make sure there's a restaurant to come back to. Once you get below that, that's when you say, "Wow, maybe it's better that I just close the doors and cut my losses until yeah. this and weather the storm, and then hopefully reopen at the end." So when you have a business model that's set to break even and that's successful, a two week shutdown just kneecaps you and just, yeah. you, there's, no, there's no other option. Oh, maybe we could limp along. You're well, pretty well not to mention, Sabata, how do you think about too, like the, uh, the startup costs uh, for getting the place open to begin with? Because you know, it's one thing to remain closed you know, in order to open, you're spending a lot of money to just get reopened. So that's, mm -hmm. that could be PPP money. It could be reserves in the bank account. It's all cash. Uh, to only cash. be to spend all of that and then uh, be shut down again just mm -hmm. a few weeks later. This is has got to be even more devastating. Cleaning costs, waste from any food that you have to dispose of, and uh, and like you said, the costs of reopening are are huge. The staff training, that's a big, that's the money that you're gambling with right there when you decide to open and say, that's in the middle of the table. That's that's the pot. I might lose it might be able to build on that, but you, you can't, um, can't assume you can get that back. Yeah, and you know, mm -hmm. Dustin, to your point, you're using the PPP money right now, almost certainly. If you're not, then you've already used it, um, but you are definitely, I, I cannot imagine if you're operating right now and you're not in that 24 week window of using it. If you have to shut down. And you're endorse, using up all your reserves. You're, you're yeah. using it, exactly right. And, yeah. and so it's devastating. So that, but that goes back to what we were talking about earlier in the show is where now you have to balance I'm being told to show, I'm sorry, to shut down. I'm, I'm being told to slow down. And, you know, you know, all eyes on California, Texas, Arizona, Florida, now New York with this. But these owners are, they have no option. And so they're, I think they're throwing their hands up and saying, yeah, we, we would love to stay home, but, but we just reopened and now we can. And, and what, if, what if you're the restaurants that are doing everything right with, with guests that are doing everything right, which I, I believe would be the, the standard. I think the exception is what we see on the news where, you know, restaurants are doing things wrong and those types of things. What do you say to them and how do you get them to, to play along with this now? I mean, mm -hmm. at some point they're just going to get out of business. And one other point, uh, many of those leases and many of those, those issues, the, the capital issues were, were negotiated and maybe finalized late May, early June. Now you're throwing this next wrench in the plan and you're saying, oh, okay, Landlord, sorry, we had a deal, but now I got to cut. I, I can't even honor that deal. I mean, it throws everything back in, into, the, into the fire. And we mm -hmm. started talking about this at the beginning about PPP money, and we were saying, well, how do you use it if you're not open? And so the extension was, was good. So now, if you are in one of those states that you had made progress and you were opening and you're using the PPP, that's all, all well and good. But when that PPP runs out and you were basically using it as a sort of a, uh, uh, a rocket booster to propel you above the break-even point. But when that PP dies out, you're right back in that same situation. Yes, maybe worse. Worse now because your state has uh, closed down, the PPP is gone, and so the costs to actually reopen it are greater. So it's almost like a false sense of security yeah. in a situation like that um, as you but look he, at it. But here's the so, other well, thing. Oh, so go ahead. Go ahead, Dustin. Oh, no, I was, I was, I'm, I'm going to go off on a different tangent. So you no, go, go ahead, Mike. Nope, I was going um, go ahead. I, I, I was going to say, you know, one, one point of view that I've heard kind of floating around from people who are most of the time outside of the restaurant business um, is, you know, could this be just looked at as like a great reset? You know, does everything need to be saved? Or is this an opportunity for, you know, the businesses that weren't in great shape to just let them, let them die off and uh, let, let the, 
kind of the growth that sprouts up from from the the damage after this to uh, to breed a more healthy yeah. a healthy uh, restaurant environment. I think the answer to all of those questions I, I think, is yes. You know, I, obviously, we have a really hard time, you know, processing that mentally just because we're so connected to the industry and we know the human beings that are behind it. But um, you know, I think it's really easy for us to kind of say that about other industries, right? I mean, we've we've talked about it. I think with the airline industry, right? It's just saying like, oh, just let it die. Somebody will buy it and fix it back up and yep. change it and rework it and it'll go back up again. Um, so, you know, is that some, is that a, a, a worthwhile perspective to take? I, I, here's my opinion on that. I think it's always a worthwhile perspective to consider whether or not you should even be in business. And you should be, if you're not examining that, you know, all the time, then I think you're doing something wrong. And I don't mean to say, should I ever be in business? I mean, is this business working? And if you're asking that question, you probably know the answer. And, and so if this is the time to reset, and if you shouldn't have been in business go in, in January, why should you be in business in June? I mean, that's just because maybe you had some PPP money or, you know, this is a time to look and consider whether or not you want to go forward. And Dustin, we've asked that on the show before. And, and I'm not saying I, I want the restaurant industry to be called out or anything like that. Right. It's, it's more of, it's, it's just more of, look, some restaurants and we've had plenty here in Boulder, for instance, just that were quite, that have been quite successful over decades say, um, we're just going to, we're just going to go out of business. We're just not going to come back. Well, and I think there's, I see if there's a moral obligation that you have, I mean, that I hope a lot of people have when it comes to your teams and saying, these people have helped me get to where I am and through the highs and the lows, and we've been able to do it. We've never seen a low this low in saying, what can I do to kind of keep these people on board, keep them going forward and keeping a roof over their, their heads. Um, so I think that has to weigh in it too, regardless of whether, how successful it is now, um, but saying, what can you do to, to continue to, to contribute and support those folks? There's a point to that. And I, I don't disagree, but I, I, and I can speak to just clients and friends that I have that have taken that route over the past three months. And they are now personally bankrupt and their, and their business is bankrupt. They will not go back into business. Those employees, um, their, their desire to take care of their employees, which is excessively noble and moral, more than any, you know, any folks really need to do. But it's bankrupted them personally and professionally to a way that they now, those people will never have the job again with that business because that business will never come back. Mm -hmm. So that's the idea of do we keep the ship afloat by sending the employees off to the to the government or to somebody, you know, some other business and, and maybe they don't all come back? Or do we let the entire ship sink with all of our employees and everybody else? And that's what that to me is that moral. Unfortunately, you know, there's ethics in business and there's morals in business, but it has to be a balance. And, and so I do think you need to consider consider that. Agreed, but I think there's also a way to be transparent with it because sometimes sure. restaurant tours aren't necessarily sharing that information with uh, the the uh, with their staff and being able to be upfront and saying, "Here's what we're up against," and yeah. we've always Agreed. wanted to. We'll get back to that point, but here's the, some of those the cuts we're making in the short term to make sure there is a long term that we can be having a conversation about. Now, here switching gears just a touch, we, we've talked. We're talking about government shutdown and we're talking about government slowing down businesses. But what about the actual marketplace just slowing down the business? And that's what I'm, we're hearing as well is that where are the customers? We thought they were going to come rushing back. And all those pictures we see in the newspaper about customers, you know, flocking to bars. I think that's one in, you know, one in a couple thousand. The, mm -hmm. There's not many people going to restaurants. That's what I'm hearing. I, what are you guys hearing? Well, it's also hard to tell what is, um, what is a trend moving forward and which is, uh, Oh my God, I'm feeling a desire that I haven't been able to fulfill for so long. I haven't been able to go out. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to be eating out in restaurants and all of a sudden there's a big spike. Okay, we're back. But then realize, okay, uh, the volume's not there. And I think you saw that with people that were great. We're killing it on the food kits and the food uh, deliveries. And then restaurants open. Okay, then that those sales plummet. Yeah. And it's really hard when we're, we have so many staggered changes and evolutions to know what's here to stay and which is just sort of a little blip on the radar for uh, an outside reason. You know, the, the guests, I think they're also tepid to do that as well. So I don't think, you know, smaller footprints and what you can do is to, to maintain full capacity, whatever that new capacity is is the best way forward to make sure that you're able to have guests in there and you can cover your costs. But once you get too big, that's when 
your overhead gets too big from a labor standpoint, from a food cost standpoint, from a production standpoint. So it's really recalibrating what that is to get your own, to set, use supply and demand of your product to the best of your advantage. Yeah, you know, and, and the other point of, of with consumer demand, and this comes from this, uh, this Grub Street article that again, I'll put in the show notes, uh, is the idea that, you know, before meal, a, a meal was a part, often a part of a, a, a larger event you know, dinner and a movie, dinner and a concert, let's go have drinks and then we'll go to dinner, you know, so a bar, then a restaurant, then going to a concert. You don't have the other events now. So the meal is the event and the meal doesn't look too attractive these days because you got to go wear masks. You're going to have a time limit on the table and you're going to have to sit outside. And if it rains, you can't come inside. And so meal as the event, can it sustain the industry? And mm-hmm. I, I don't know that it can. And will people want to sit inside or at a table or one location with people they don't know for that long um, yeah. as well um, with it? And I think some of those are new to diners. In some places, you've had time limits on tables before. And I've been in restaurants before when it's always felt uncomfortable to quote what we would call an out by to a yeah. guest, say, I need the table back by this time because that's rushing them or didn't feel like hospitality. But now, as I look at it through the, the lens of survival, uh, saying, it's part of that contract between a guest and a restaurant. And I remember we were running late to a restaurant last week um, with my girlfriend in, when I was in uh, DC and she was saying, she's like, Oh, I didn't realize they were this busy. And I was like, of course, when you have 50% capacity, yep. if we are late, that potentially compromises their ability to maximize the revenue that they need to. And I'd even throw in there. So now to be able to say to a guest, clearly we need the table back. We're giving you two hours and that allows us, allows you to have a pleasant, reasonably paced meal. You're not being rushed. You can take your time. Uh, But it also allows us to sanitize the table, turn the table uh, in order for the next guest to come in an efficient manner so that we're not compromising social distancing or uh, cleanliness and, and safety standards. So that's part of the new guest to restaurant contract. And I think and another, I, my, go ahead, Mike. Well, I was gonna say, I, and I think you can, again, all through communication, you can sell that. And, you know, in fine dining, knowing that a table is going to turn is generally, I think in fine dining, you generally know that, hey, look, there's going to be two or three turns per, per evening. I'm on, what turn are you on? I'm dining on the first turn. I know I have to give up that table by 30. I mean, if I'm ordering a lot of wine or something, um, or Dustin's ordering a lot of wine, I don't do the order with Dustin. Um, then we're going to, they'll let you stay or, you know, they'll work it out. But tell me if I need to leave, you know, or say up front, you have the table for two hours. And is that going to work for you? You know, yes, it yeah. is. Okay, thank you. Like, set the expectation. Yeah, I, I look at this as an opportunity to, because I think turn times and, and kind of setting that expectation with the guests, I, I agree with you, Sav, has always kind of felt weird in the past. Uh, now it's kind of a necessity. So I wonder if it's one of those things that's going to, a trend that's going to exist post all of this. If it's something that we can, if we implement it the right way, if we can find the right language or the right way to communicate it and still make it feel hospitable, that uh, this is something that could maybe go into the new normal in the future, because I think that certainly would help restaurants considerably. I mean, I, unless, you know, unless you're uh, just not really that busy, you know, you need those tables back. And I've seen that cripple restaurants in a, in a variety of ways, not even just from a revenue standpoint, but also the way it impacts, you know, the guests that are coming in that expected to be sat at 830. But, you know, the first turn is just hanging out, camping, just sipping on their water, not moving. Yeah, it's different. Check, yeah, it's it's you different know, when so there's there's a when snowball effect there too. But if if you can implement something that feels good from the guest's point of view, and helps the operations, and then also helps the business, uh, I would hope that that's something that we could see going into the long term. I think the issue it's different when you're sitting there sipping on on water with no ice in it and ordering you know another thousand dollar bottle of wine. <laughs> so maybe that maybe that table gets to stay, and all of a sudden the two hours goes out the window. But at, at one point, it's not just you're losing out on the opportunity. Now it's, you're not just losing out on the opportunity cost of that second turn on the table. But now if you're actually pushing that table, uh, the people that showed up on time for their reservation wasn't ready. And I, as a restaurant, have to now buy them a round of drinks. Yeah. I'm further indebted and my profitability is down. And the other part of this is I think it really goes to how a restaurant can, can money ball this now. And, and I say that in, in the, the term to uh, maximize the, the throughput and the profitability. 
but not at the expense of the experience, the hospitality, the integrity of what you do. And it's if you look at a, a four top and if you only have four tables and you're selling those as three tops, that's potentially losing 25% of your revenue right there. And yeah. in this day and age, when you need to maximize every um, opportunity and diversify, it's a different mindset of how you look at it. And so are you really, you know, if you put a deuce on a four top, that's 50% of your, the potential that that table could have. And that, that table and those seats are a perishable commodity. That, that's gonna, you can no longer sell that again once it's been sold. So people have to look at how to best maximize that in a different manner than you had before. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. I like the idea of money ball in the restaurant. And, and this is, you know, going to the idea or the, the question that you asked uh, a few moments ago, Dustin, about is this a time to consider whether you should even be in business or not? How about is this a time for you to consider how to rerun your business? Maybe yes. take, took a look at it through, you know, I want, 100%. I now want Billy Bean, Mr. Sabato over there, money ball in my restaurant and saying, here are the numbers, guys. And here's yeah. how we're going to do it. I mean, now you need, you need demand to do that. I mean, it's, it's, you have to have a, you have to understand your demand, but if I have an economist in there crunching numbers and saying, look, this is how we're going to do it. And 15 minutes late equates to this. And so we're not going to, you know, here's how we're going to plan. Boy, that's an exceptional thought process. And even if it doesn't lead to a complete revamp of your business, if it helps even just a little, we're adding money to the bottom line. And how can that? Yeah. Well, so I think about, think think about like uh, how restaurants operate with regards to these kind of turn times versus just about any other activity that you go out to experience, right? You go to a ball game or you go to a concert or you go to a a play or something like that. Um, you know, you go, you, you sit down, it starts when it starts. Right. And then when it's over, it's time to go. You know, yeah, it has an end. kind of like hang out afterwards and relax and kick your feet up and, and not do anything. Um, and I know, you know, for restaurants, we kind of, we emphasize the hospitality and always taking care of the guests. Um, but I think, I think this is all teaching us that maybe there's some middle ground that we need to find. Well, it's a retraining um, because yeah. when I go to a hotel, which is which is pure hospitality. I mean, that's the, ho- the hospitality industry. I think you still got to check out by 11 a.m. You have to check out. And if you, you want later. to, if you want to check right. out later, you might pay $1,000 a room for a, a night. You still have a checkout. Yeah. And, they, and they might say, look, you can extend it to one or you can extend it to four, but you, you need pay to pay a little leave. bit more. That's right. I love that idea of like, hey, your, your, your seating time is just about up. If yep. you'd like to stay longer, it's going to cost you another extra hundred dollars. Yeah. What if you're, or, I mean, or you could use that reserv- use that hundred dollars to buy yourself another bottle of wine. Yeah, we need you to order reserv- something. What if your reservation app was like the parking meter app? Your table's about to expire. Would you like to extend? Press right. one for yes, two for no, <laughs> and then you could re up on that, and now, then you I pay think, another twenty five bucks. And it's going to cost you. You got to spend money, and you got to figure out. You know, as the restaurant tour, what what dollar amount per hour, whatever it is, do you need from each table in order to make things sustainable? So that and then the guest has that option. It's either so, like pay up and go now, or if we're going to sit longer, let's order another bottle of wine and rock and roll. Yeah, and I think for me, it's it's that works in a cafe setting, certainly in the coffee shop setting where you know, the, the PhD barista is, is sitting down having, you know, a, a $1.50 shot of espresso and staying there for eight hours, you know, working on their Mac, right? That is a, a complete, that to me is, yeah, do you want to rent more time at my space? Fine. But if you're at a restaurant where maybe even, you know, service might be a touch slow, and then you're going to charge me for a table, uh, you know, to extend, that, that's not going to work. Um, but I think the, the principle of I'm heading into my reservation, you know, I get my talk reservation or whatever it might be. And it says, you are reserved at this table at Dustin's restaurant from 6.30 p.m. till 8.30 p.m. Do you want, to, do you want this reservation? Yes, I do. And I click yes. I, gotta, I have 6.30 to 8.30. That's my expectation. That's what's been agreed to. The terms and conditions can be right there. And if, if I start mouthing off at 8.30 when they say you have to leave, hey, buddy, this was the expectation. This is what you agreed to. Yeah. Do you want to stay longer? I can see if we can accommodate that. Um, yeah. But the fact is you agreed to two hours. And, and I mean, nobody's going to want to have that argument. Nobody does. But, the, but it, it might help to set the expectation ahead of time to say, you I are, agree. You are renting the table. We will serve your food during that period of time. And Dustin, if you yeah. decide to hire Mike um, as your maitre d', 
I might maybe coach him to, to not refer to guests as, hey, buddy. Um, hey, that really I was talking <laughs> to myself. <laughs> okay. That's, that, I was saying yeah. in that case, they were saying, to, hey, hey, I'm the buddy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. Well, you know, here's another thing that's on that line of reopening and in the different marketplace. Where are the consumers in the restaurant side? We know where a lot of them are from the alcohol purchasing side, and that is direct to consumer, both from the winery and the retailer. And there's been some, you know, over the past couple, uh, pa past couple of months, we've talked about it here, and there's been a lot of articles written as well about how the increase of e-commerce sales um, di shipped direct to consumers of alcohol is, is on the complete rise. Um, now, it's important to understand here the difference between DTC, which is direct to consumer, so DTC from like a winery per se, I'm sorry, a winery versus DTC from like a retail shop. They're very, very different. And this is where the, you know, the, where the regulations and the law really are annoying and a lot of people just do not like them, but it's the system, the three tier system that we have. So oh, I think 46 states right now allow DTC from winery into the state. So that means if I really want, you know, a Dustin's winery wine, I can, I can, he can sell it to me in Colorado if he has the proper license, right? And so I can get that wine. But what I can't do is order from like a wine shop in Oregon, like Portland, Oregon, if there's a great wine shop and I want to buy, you know, a couple cases of a specific wine I can't get here. I can't buy that and legally have it shipped to me in Colorado, right? There are, there are models by which retail shops are trying to operate. Um, they're called passage of title models, frankly. And it's, it's this, I think, supportable position that through passage of title, I take, I take possession of the wine in Portland, Oregon, and then I, I arrange to have it shipped to me as my personal property in Colorado. That's how a lot of the e-commerce liquor is being done, beer, wine, and spirits, but it's being challenged. And, and the reason I wanted to talk about this today is, is that um, we are, because of the influx of e-commerce ordering of alcohol throughout the country during this COVID period of time, the enforcement is going to start ramping up and in fact it already has because the the number is in the billions and and in, when that amount of money is moving around potentially not tax paid or not licensed through uh, by any given state the the regulators are going to start to crack down and that's what we're seeing so um so that's so Mike, just uh if oh, i yeah. can jump in just for a second just uh i've got some data here that i think is really interesting um to, to look at some numbers u.s e-commerce penetration as a percentage of sales. Uh, so in the retail sector, this is, this is overall, this is not just to wine, okay. but uh, overall percentage of retail sales of e-commerce. If you look back at 2009, that number was about five and a half percent. It has grown you know, steadily over time with uh, finishing up 2019 at 16%. So over the course of 10 years, rising about uh, 10 and a half percent. From well, three hundred percent up ten percentage points. Yeah, up ten percentage points. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, it's a sixteen percent of the uh, of total retail sales between t uh, the end of twenty nineteen and uh, April of twenty twenty. It went from sixteen percent to twenty seven percent. Wow, and that's that makes sense. So talk about an acceleration of trends. You know, yeah. e commerce to have it go take ten years to go ten points. And then it went 10 points in less than six months. And, 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 that's, and so part of that is, can that be sustained? Can it, can it sit at 27%? Because I would, I would posit that quite a bit of that 10% would be, um, would be under the governmental orders allowing shipping inter, in, in a state, not across state borders. And then quite a bit of potentially um, non-licensed, let's call it non-licensed interstate sell, sale of alcohol it would be mm -hmm. a big part of that 10% as well. And with the idea of, hey, look, it's COVID, just sell, 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 whatever we can. Um, but you know, I've had just friends and, and clients call me and ask, or not clients, but potential clients, and ask, hey, how can we do this e-commerce model with alcohol and, and you know, beer, spirits, and wine? Um, how can we do it? Everybody else is doing it. And you start to walk through the risks associated with it, given you know, the re we had a recent decision in Michigan with a federal court saying, we no longer, we're overruling um, the lower court's uh, determination that out-of-state sales into Michigan, in this particular case, were, were legal. And so we're having the courts really rule against the e-commerce interstate shipping of, of alcohol. And I think that trend's going to continue, uh, unfortunately, for the consumer. 
Um, but it's hard to you, you you think that it's going to continue in the uh, against being against interstate shipping of alcohol? Yes, I do. I don't like that. I'm I every you know I take positions and I come up with legal theories as do other you know liquor lawyers uh, as to why that should not be the case. But as they are being challenged in state courts, the state's ability to regulate the sale of alcohol within their state is generally being seen is generally being uh, interpreted to let's just for lack of a better term override. Uh, an individual's ability to send into a particular state. So I, I do think for the time being, we're gonna see those laws, those that the ability to ship interstate um, enforced. Now, I think the, the way I'm looking at it here is, I think 16, 13 or 16 states permit uh, uh, out of state retailers um, to, ship into their, to ship into their states if they have a license. And generally that's easy to get. Um, but that leaves a lot of, of holes. Like I said, in Colorado, I can't just call, uh, you know, Rare Wine Company and, and order wine into Colorado. I'm, I'm not supposed to be allowed to do that. And so um, if I, I would like to be able to do that. Um, but I, I can only, or, you know, call up a winery and order direct from that winery. Winery, you know, wine manufactured by that winery, not something that they just have in their cell. Which is, which is what DTC is. I think a lot of people hear the term DTC when they talk about wine and they think just ordering wine to get delivered to their house. And that's yeah, not they do. the case. DTC is direct to consumer, which means the person that made it, the company that made it, is is shipping it directly to them. That's so right. So if you're buying from a retailer, that's not DTC. You're just you're that's just e-commerce. That's like that's a, you know that's buying, exactly right. buying a you know buying a, a you know anything piece of equipment or something from Target and having it delivered. Yeah, and so uh, you know a couple points there is that's exactly right. And what I was trying to distinguish in the beginning is when you when you read now about DTC, it, it is. I think the lines are being blurred and, and uh, you know, whoever's, you know, the, the folks that are writing about it or discussing it are not doing a good enough job of educating the public that DTC is exactly what you said, Dustin, is the manufacturer of the product goes direct to consumer. That means there's no wholesaler in between. It does not go through the three tier system. It goes direct to the consumer. Um, yeah. Sorry, Sabato, go ahead. I was going to ask how that applies to distilleries. Well, so that's a great question. So distilleries, be, uh, you know, it's funny in America, um, distilled spirits are treated different than wine and beer. And now wine and beer are treated differently as well, but more so because of the lobby of the beer wholesalers. Um, distilled spirits are still very uh, regulated due to moonshine and bootlegging. That that just has never really gotten away. So uh, just Is there a G on the end of bootlegging? I, I, I... No, I say bootleg in. Okay, yeah. with an apostrophe. Okay. <laughs> bootlegging is when a guy like me gets like U2 concerts for free. That's okay, bootleg. Got it. Bootleg, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's a bootleg, you know, on maps okay. or something. Got it. I used to live in West Virginia, so bootlegging is what I had heard before. Yeah, bootlegging's right. Exactly right. So you know. Um, but, you know, for instance, if the three of us wanted to open a distillery, um, we could not on our own make in our house uh, you know, uh, moonshine or a vodka or a whiskey. That's illegal. We're not allowed, you're not allowed to distill until you have what's called a DSP, a distilled spirit. Can we, spirit can we talk product. offline about that whole thing about making uh, liquor at home? I just, yeah. I might need to clarify a couple yeah, things. Yeah, clear out, clear out the bathtub and get some gin blossom. And <laughs> might need some help uh, from uh, your lawyer. <laughs> Put your lawyer hat on to help me out with some. Uh, some what do I hear? Do I hear? Yeah, I hear a kettle in the back. Um, so, no, but so that's just an example of how regulated the distilled spirits world is. And there's Pappy Van Winkle and, and Blanton's being, you know, Japanese whiskey being sold, you know, around the country and, and being shipped around. That's all very illegal. It's just not, you are not allowed to ship DTC distilleries, uh, I'm sorry, distilled spirits, except now for in eight, I think there's eight states now. And I think New York's either just came online or recently coming online. Kentucky's coming online. I mean, that's a good thing. But again, it's the same idea of, you know, that means that Buffalo Trace is the entity that is allowed to sell to me in a state that allows it the Pappy Van Winkle or a Buffalo Trace or whatever the case may be. It, it doesn't mean that a retailer that has it can take it, mark it up to $3,500 for the bottle and then sell it to me. That's not a DTC sale going to Dustin's point. So they are very different. And it's a good question because, you know, same thing with beer. Beer is, is differently, rec it's, it's regulated differently. We have wine, which includes cider. We have fermented malt beverages, which includes, beer and most of the hard seltzers at this point. And then we have distilled spirits, which includes some canned cocktails, but traditional distilled spirits. They're all regulated differently. I mean, it makes it a nightmare for me. And it's certainly a nightmare for, for the public who just says, I'm in California and I want a bottle of Pappy. Why can't I just order it? And the answer is because you can't. 
so know. take away if you take away the lobbyists and the the laws right now mike and i'm asking you if i was asking yeah. you to write the laws sh sh why or why shouldn't it be consistent for beer wine and liquor in terms of how we handle it in what we legislate um for 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 those yeah i think if you take the lobby out of it all three should be treated equally i, I really do believe that but we're not getting we're not going to get there uh the lobby you know the, the beer distributors the wine distributors and the, and the distilled spirits sometimes they all three they ha you know a company has all three and um that's not always the case but sometimes they have all three but they're just they're different they're different markets um, I think they should be regulated differently. I, I'm sorry, they should be regulated the same as, you know, their alcohol. But, you know, understanding that they, they're just not going to be. Now, I would say, do I think that we should be allowed to do interstate shipping from a pure uh, free market guy? You know, I'm a free, pure free market guy, closer to pure than, than to not. Um, I do think that we should get closer to allowing interstate shipping through, li through essentially through allowing licensing. But I do believe that states should be allowed to license and regulate the, the, the flow and exchange of alcohol within their states. Mm -hmm. And that's something as simple as being able to determine who is checking IDs. How can we, you know, who is preventing wine from getting in the hands of somebody under the age of 21? And if you're sending it through FedEx from New York to Colorado, there's nobody checking that ID, period. But is there a facial recognition or No, you print, can do that. Like that. No, like, no, no, you can do that. They're not doing it, is my right. point. And, and right. so um, if, if I think that the, the future of the laws would, would be, okay, we're going to allow the, you know, or the states are going to allow interstate shipping um, through licensing. So in Colorado, you'd say, fine, you can get an interstate shipper retail permit, right? Pay us $1,000 a, 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 a year. We now regulate you. You have to, cons you know, you have to be under our watch because you're going to be sell you're going to be putting alcohol into our system, and we don't just allow anybody to do that. We have to make sure that you are, uh, you're responsible, that you are not a felon, that you're not, you know, uh, you're not, you don't have a bunch of, I'm sorry, suspended licenses because of poor activity. Let us regulate you. I think that's the way to do it. And ultimately, if we see those changes, it's going to have to be that way. The idea that it's just going to be a national free for all of no three tier system and just retailers shipping everything, I, I, I don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. Well, why do, with the three-tier system, why do states allow DTC? Just knowing that that's gotta be a huge revenue generator for them if they're, getting, ta get, they're getting money at all, they're picking three the same, people's pockets. It's the same idea, is that a winery would, let's just use Colorado for an example, a California winery would get, would obtain uh, a, a, Cal, uh, I'm sorry, a Colorado DTC license. They pay for it. They'd go through the process of getting it, their fingerprints, and you know they'd be checked out essentially. So Mandavi's would have to do that. And then I, as a consumer, I don't know what the limit is, but I can buy, let's say, five cases a year from Mandavi DTC, and it's limited. So you know, five cases is a lot, but it's also not a, not enough to hurt a wholesaler. You know, it's just not it's not enough. Plus you know, a winery is really not doing a good job by its wholesalers if it gives it a special deal to, uh, to DTC customers. So if I order on first release, you know, some, you know, a brand new, again, Napa Cabernet, I'm paying $135. It might be $125 at my local liquor store, you know, because uh, the, the, it, would, it would make no sense for the winery to give it to me cheaper than its wholesalers and its retailers, because then the retailers are going to say, well, we're not going to sell your product. So it's, it's this balance, it's this balance there and it doesn't end up hurting the three tier system because it doesn't take a chunk out of the wholesale or the retail because it's a very limited quantity. Does that make sense? Thank you. All this to me, Mike, just sounds like, uh, you know, more reasons why the three tier system is just terrible. Well, okay. I want to agree with you. And I think, I, I, you know, so I want to agree with you. Can we just make that guys. go away? <laughs> You're a pretty smart guy. Can you figure uh, that out for us? Well, so if we got rid of the three tier system though, Budweiser and Miller Coors would own all the bars and that would be a problem. That's all you would have to drink there. Now I would be okay just drinking I don't know Miller if they would own all the bars. They, they would, would own, own a lot of the bars, Dustin. They don't own a lot of the bars. They would own a lot of bars. Not all the bars though, Mike. Okay. But you're, but I thought you were for now, a free market too. This I, I market. get that. And so yeah. I would say that if you want to go complete free market, then yes, you tear down the walls and you just compete with those guys. 
and yeah. and, it, and you won't have independent. You probably won't have many independent wine shops, and you probably won't have well, many. Yeah, then, then then Amazon would jump in, and we'd all be dead. <laughs> well, Amazon would be the retailer, but yes, that's exactly right. They would they would yeah. what Amazon, if I'm Amazon and there's no three tier system, I'm buying both. I have all the money in the world. I can buy both Budweiser, Miller Coors, and I can just say, here it is, world. I can sell it to you. So, you know, I got into an, uh, a heated argument, a uh, politely heated argument with a, a guy named Reyes, who's uh, um, heir to the, the biggest, or maybe he was running the biggest beer distributorship in California, maybe the, the country at this point. Um, and I said, I, you know, I said, you know, from a craft beer perspective, this three tier system has got to go. He got really pissed at me. And he's like, how, you know, you guys just want to get rid of this three tier system. You don't know what the hell you're talking about. What do you want to be like England? And, uh, you know, he's really, he was drunk and he was pissed. And years later, I look back and I'm like, well, he was right. Because, you know, there would be a, a huge, to just jump now to a non three tier system. We're just set up. We live in that world. You'd put industries out of business. And, you know, it would take, I didn't think it would take gener a generation at least to, to kind of work itself out where it wasn't, um, you know, where it wasn't completely damaging the retail and wholesale system. I mean, it would really only benefit at that point, the manufacturers who then afford to buy the retail arm. So, I mean, I'd love to have, we could do a whole show on three tier system. I mean, it, it's a, it's a great, interesting topic. Um, it, it's a boring in parts, but it's exciting as well. I don't know it, if I'd call it interesting to. Well, Hey, you're living a, in it, dude. It's you dynamic. Better, you, you better think it's interesting. <laughs> buddy, it's your world. Hey buddy. That's right. Uh, hey buddy. <laughs> and I mean, as soon as I see Amazon, look to purchase rainforest cafe i know something's going down because they're always ahead of the curve and that's how they can just already they have the branding it flows all the way through and they, they can want, no pun yeah. intended flow waterfall exactly. you know the oh, rainforest yeah. tying it in yeah. exactly. <laughs> jumping into the pool yeah <laughs> i mean it's interesting stuff but uh, we'll keep an eye on it for you and uh thanks everybody for joining of course uh, gents have a great independence day um please share the podcast with your friends give us a couple likes and be sure to subscribe we're gonna have some amazing episodes coming up we'll be announcing those soon but over the next two weeks we have some exceptional guests coming and we're looking forward to it so like i said uh make sure you share this with your friends we are still live on or not we're not doing live but we're still up on youtube and uh have a great day have a great week everybody see you guys